How are you, everyone? Uh, I'm John Picasso. I'm joined here by some amazing illustrators. We're going to introduce ourselves here in a second. Uh, this is a, a discussion here for Lightbox Expo Online. Uh, this is creating the illustrated novel. Um, we're going to be discussing um, our experiences uh, creating our own narratives uh, in words and pictures. Uh, some of us are further along than others. I'm going to be moderating this discussion today largely because I have the questions that I want to ask these people who have been through these experiences who are further along the road than I am. And if you're watching this, hopefully you're wanting to do this as well. I think it's, a, it's, it's one of the best things we can do as creators to be able to tell our own stories as opposed to just be hired hands. Um, I've seen a lot of people very happy being hired hands for their entire life uh, as illustrators. And I thought for a long time, that's all I wanted to be. But when I came in, that was it. That was the dream. Uh, it's since morphed from that. So for me, um, I'm a 20 year illustrator now professionally. I've uh, been doing it full time since, oh, yes, yeah, well, since 01. Um, and uh, done a lot of book covers, done a lot of product illustration, but over the last several years, I've been um, working on something called Loteria, which is be me being 100% Mexican American. I am creating card, I thought I was creating a card series inspired by this game of chance that I grew up with. And it turned into a, a story that I wanted to create, and I am working on it now. We're going to, together, we're going to learn from some of these other creators about what they did to put their projects together, and we're going to introduce ourselves right now. Mia, will you start us off? Yeah, I'm Mia Araujo. I'm a self-employed uh, fantasy artist, and I've actually been showing my work in galleries since uh, about 2008 till about 2013. And actually 2013 is when I got the idea, like the first germ of an idea for the current project I'm working on, which is an illustrated novel uh, based on Alice in Wonderland. It's a sister story. It's set in West Africa and it's gonna be a high fantasy world. Um, the story is about sisters, about love, loss, and finding yourself through reconnecting with nature. And I'm currently on the second draft of the novel portion and have a lot of the artwork made right now, but um, it's still a long way to go. Uh, but yeah, it's really great to be with all, uh, all of you here. <laughs> great. I'm Greg Manchess, and I did a painting years ago called Above the Timberline, and uh, got enough interest, people asking me, what the heck is that about? And I realized that I could write a story about that character, because he, he lived so much in my head when I created the painting. And then I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, I, I want to do, I want to do a novel but with all pictures and have the type flow in there. And uh, so I didn't think I could do this, but I, I took off after it anyway. And we'll talk about it today. But uh, uh, this was at a point in my career where I had been illustrating for uh, 35 years or something and finally had decided, wait a minute, wait a minute, I know how to do this. <laughs> And so I, I started writing, I started sketching, and uh, eventually I got the book published. And um, I'm still freelancing, and I'm writing, and I'm just compiling and adding to the excitement I've had about my career all since the first day. And uh, I hope that continues. I have a ton of stories, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Armand. Uh, my name is Armand Baltazar, and uh, ever since I could remember from being a kid, I wanted to create my own stories, make my own art, and I ended up taking a long way around. Uh, I set out to do that in my career, and about uh, a little over 25, 30 years ago, I started working in advertising, hated it, went back to learn how to write and illustrate stories, fell into animation, which is where I worked for about 20 years. Uh, helping other people realize their visual stories. And uh, right along that time, I had a son who kind of reminded me that I used to have a love for crafting stories. So I set about to make a story for him and it ended up launching a second career, perhaps maybe the true career that I always had from uh, my childhood, which was to create stories and to illustrate them and put them out there. I created a story called um, Timeless, Diego and the Rangers of the Vast Atlantic. I've since taken a break from film work for the most part, although I do a little freelance. And I am uh, currently creating book two. It's uh, written, I'm trying to now make it better and illustrate it. And I'm on the path to getting that out into the world. Excellent, excellent. Victoria. Hi, uh, my name is Victoria Ying and I 
like Armand, um, started my career in animation. Uh, when I was in the eighth grade, my yearbook says that I wanted to write and draw my own comics because of Japanese mangaka. But uh, I drifted from that position just kind of due to the realities of the comics world and found animation, which had a lot of the same storytelling aspects that I loved along with illustration. Um, about two years ago, I actually, like Armand, like rediscovered my, my first love, which is storytelling and really committed myself to writing my own books. Um, so City of Secrets, which is my debut graphic novel, uh, just came out July 28th. Um, and currently I'm working on the second volume, which is gonna come out in July of 2021. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, fantastic. Beautiful. Ian, finish us off here. All right, I'm Ian McKeg, and um, I am an animator, writer, illustrator, filmmaker, um, and several other things, which makes me sound extremely schizophrenic. Um, <laughs> but really, it's just one thing, and that's storytelling. And that's, that's kind of how I identified myself. People ask me who my biggest influences are, expecting Norman Rockwell and Frank Frazetta and people like that, but actually it was Ray Bradbury. Um, I read his stories as a kid and my head exploded with images and I had to draw them down or it would have exploded. And then I had to write my own because that, that was filling up my head too. Um, I've been working for about 40 years now and uh, there's been a mix. There's been a mix of uh, mostly art, but also about 15 to 20 screenplays um, and, uh, and one novel. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about that one novel and how I cheated and tricked my publisher into letting me publish it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, so like I said in the intro for, for, for the audience out there, you know, we, we had a really, um, a really successful talk last year at Lightbox where we, we talked about the process of how these, these, uh, these books and stories were, were created or, or are being created. And, and this year I wanted to talk more about the publishing aspect, but uh, we, I'm not sure how much you guys are going to be able to access that talk at this moment or not. It, it, it seems to be a little bit fuzzy whether that, that's posted online or not. Maybe Bobby will get to post it. And if he doesn't, maybe it's the best thing to do is to just give a little thumbnail or recap a little bit of that journey. I'm going to sneak up on it through the back way, though. I, I just kind of came up with this actually when we were uh, talking uh, in the intro right before this started hit recording. Um, there was something I read in an interview with Victoria, and it popped in. It popped something for me, so I'm I'm sneaking up on the panelists with this right now. Um, what's the one experience, or what was was there a moment when you realized that it wasn't good enough for you just to be a hired hand creating images for other people's stories, and that you really really needed to be your own create your own narrative? Was there a, either a story or a narrative or a moment that did that for you? Um, and let's try to maybe approach process through, through this question. Mia, Mia, do you want to start us off with that? Yeah, I think I have a really different, you know, background from everyone else here because I've actually only been hired for one thing, and that was way back in 2008 to do a book cover. And before that, I had already been doing gallery work. Um, and so there wasn't really a moment. I know in art school, I had teachers that worked in editorial and, you know, did all kinds of freelance illustration. But towards the end of like my senior year, I started seeing that a couple of my teachers, Nathan Oda and Bob Dobb were actually showing their work in galleries in the high fructose and juxtaposed scene. And I was really intrigued by that world and uh, seeing all these artists uh, sort of just live off their vision and just sell their original paintings to collectors. And um, I was still definitely exploring my style and, and all that kind of stuff. And maybe it wasn't the right move, but that's, I just went for it. And luckily my dad said, you know, if you don't make a profit within the first year, then you got to look for work. And, and I did. So I just kind of kept going. And then, um, but so I kind of went about it in an opposite way where it's because that was so addicting to me to create my own worlds and stories and stuff like that um, through at least gallery paintings uh, around 2014, when I was having, uh, I, I was working on this idea and I knew that the blue sky period and the development stage of this project was going to take a lot of time and it would be a lot of unpaid time. I actually decided to take a non-art job in the service industry and have been doing that for the last six years to pay the bills, to take the pressure off of my art so that I could pursue the story. And um, I do have an amazing boyfriend that's been supporting me as well. So I, I do think that's something that needs to be talked about because sometimes you do need a kite string so that you can chase your own dreams. 
Uh, you need an awesome dad that gives you that one year, you know, like timeline or an awesome boyfriend that will support you or be willing to do, you know, a job that's not really fun and not really about art at all. But, um, but that's what I was willing to do to get my story off the ground and to keep pursuing my own stories. But um, at the same time, not everybody has that opportunity, you know, like uh, they have to make a certain amount of money. That option isn't available to them. But that's at least um, how I went about my career. Excellent. Greg, I know we, we, a lot of us have seen that original painting that started off Timberline. Um, yeah. But what, you know, there had to have been a seed before that painting happened that made you say, I, you, there was an itch, like you think yeah. it needed to scratch. What, what, where did that, where, when did that happen in your career? Well, the thing is, I, I wish it had happened earlier, but uh, it's a whole thing about whether you believe in yourself or not, I guess. But uh, I, my career was successful as a freelance illustrator. So I, I was getting work all the time. And all this was building because I was doing book covers for people. And I realized that every time I was doing a book cover, I had to project story into the characters and what they were asking me to do. So I was communicating all the time with developing other people's stuff. And uh, when I was contacted about doing a a how-to video about how I paint. Uh, I slammed this idea together, and I think it was an epiphany that I, I focused everything on this character and the point of view. And I, that's when I realized I was projecting the story with my artwork. I mean, it reflected quickly to me what I was doing, and I hadn't been paying attention to that. And I realized <laughs> I've been doing this for decades. And now I got to do it for me. And when that painting was done, it was drop mic time. I said, that's what I've been wanting to do. And so uh, it was an epiphany. And the other epiphany was I read voraciously and have written all my life, but I have never attempt to, attempted before to go to a publisher and go, hey, this, I want to do this. And a friend of mine saw that painting and said, you got to get that in front of a publisher. I'm telling you, and uh, I, he didn't even know if I had a story or not. He just said, <laughs> do it. And uh, that was my challenge. So uh, that, that was it for that one anyway. Perfect. Armand, what was, the, what was the impetus that launched Timeless that made you say, I've got to do this 600 page behemoth? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, it's, the thing is, is you, you're gonna find this universal kind of thing in all of our stories, right? And, and, and it's kind of like when you talk to a person about why do you do what you do? And um, it's not so much that we, what we all do is a job. It's, it's that something chose us, right? Like this vocation chose us. Storytelling chose us. Image making to tell stories chose us. And I think that if it's inherently in there, that voice is talking, you're either going to listen to it or it's not. And one of the things kind of like what happened with Greg was for me was a uh, you know, I had to make a living or like Mia, like I had to make sure my parents thought I wasn't going to starve. So I gravitated towards the kind of uh, storytelling, the kind of art making that I could make a living from, you know? And the thing is, is when you decide you're going to make your own story, like your own original art, put it in front of the world, it's the scariest thing in the world. It's terrifying because you're afraid of failure. You, you have all this doubt, you have all these things. So when I say that um, the moment came for when my son asked me to make a story, he didn't just, uh, for him, that prompted Timeless. It's that he prompted a deeper question, which was, why am I so scared to take the risk of making this story? You know, I had to answer that question. And uh, it was scary. And that's, that's the thing I think maybe perhaps people don't cross that point because the business part, all that, that we're going to talk about, that's really, really hard. And you have to answer that first question. It's like, is it in you to do? Do you want to do it? And know that it's going to be hard and it's going to be scary. And so he asked the question. I think that was the thing that prompted me. Um, and when I sat down to do it, it's sort of, well, actually, I'll just back up for a second. It happened right at the exact point in my life that a good friend of mine was trying to do the same thing. And in watching him try to go for uh, his dream, it kind of was a wake up call between my son and what he was doing to, uh, to pursue it myself. And that was the moment that I decided uh, it's great to be a wonderful artist for other, other storytellers. Take a chance on yourself for once and see what happens. Beautiful, beautiful. 
Victoria, again, congratulations. The book's out, City of Secrets. So, you know, I, I, like I said, your interview actually that I saw a couple hours ago, um, it, it prompted this, this, this thread that we're on right now. And there, there did seem to be a beat and I don't think the interview even answered that question. So that's why I'm looking for the answer now. What, what was it that made you make that pivot where you said, I, I've, got to, I've got to tell my own story here? Sure, um, yeah, so when I started at Disney, I had graduated from Art Center College of Design and their program was very focused on how do you get a job? Like, here's the skills that you need in order to be employable right away, which is great because that did make me employable right away. Um, and I got to work at Disney, which was like my dream. And I was in visual development, which was like, this is the, the top goal. Uh, but once I got there, I realized there was this other team of people in the story department. And I had been under the assumption that storyboarding was like, you just take a script and you translate it, that's it. But in animation, it's a really different job because you actually tell the story. You actually do a lot of writing as a story artist. And uh, once I got to Disney and I saw that, I was like, oh my God, that's the job that I want. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd kind of like set myself on a path that was different than the one that I actually had wanted to do. Um, but I also realized that like my own confidence in that realm wasn't quite there. Like I thought, um, that these films and these books and these movies, they, they start out perfect. You know, it's like, oh, you produce it and it's great. Um, and it wasn't until I was working at Disney that I realized actually that these take a lot of work and they kind of start bad and then they get better, you know, like that's the process of writing. Writing is rewriting. And the first draft is never what you think it's going to be. So I kind of got inspired because I was like, oh, I can make a bad thing. <laughs> I know how to do that. Like maybe I can actually make it good with work. So um, that's when I decided to try my very first NaNoWriMo, which is how my story came about. Um, my first book was a, uh, if you guys haven't heard of NaNoWriMo, it's hey. National Novel Writing Month. And it takes place during November every year. You write 50,000 words in one month. And, um, you know, having that backing to know that it didn't have to be good, it just had to exist that was really the thing that propelled me to be able to see this as something that could be good, even though it wasn't at the beginning. Beautiful. Ian, you could have just rested on your laurels and been one of the most legendary concept artists in the history of, of the world, but that wasn't good. <laughs> so you had to go write this narrative and put all these things together in the shadow line. What the hell made you do it? Oh, uh, so I'm that weird kid that loved school. And I, I loved it, every day of it. Because for me, it was training you for a mission on Mars, right? And obviously, they spoke French and Mars, so you had Latin, and you had to learn those things. Because, And I knew it wasn't real, but I, I made that up. And so I loved every day of school. So in my career, where I would, you know, design a new Sith Lord, or I would illustrate, you know, a Christmas Carol, or whatever it happens to be, um, that was always the best job in the world. Not because someone else wrote was taking care of the story or wasn't taking care of the story or whether the story was even mine or someone else's, that didn't matter. It was more, is there a space for me? Is there something that hasn't been done in there? So when I illustrated Alice in Wonderland, it, a big part of it was just, nobody draws Alice smiling. What the heck? She's seven years old. I, I still smile all the time, but she was, you know, she's a kid. So I just wanted to illustrate Alice in Wonderland with Alice smiling. And, and that was a hole left in that text for me. So when I work on a film, um, really, truly, throughout my career, I don't take projects if there's no hole for me, either because there's nothing in it. There's no, the, the story itself is just garbage and, and they wouldn't listen to feedback even if I gave it. Or uh, it's perfect. Why would I do? I'd rather sit in the audience and watch it. So I, I usually turn away about half of everything that I'm offered and um, I don't take on things that uh, very rarely just to pay the bills. Um, I did work at Kentucky Fried Chicken so Mia I know what those service jobs are like. I was the chef <laughs> and it was awesome. I mean awesome in the most horrible possible way, right? So much but, story material. <laughs> right, story material. The yeah. characters there, the wasps and the rubber bands used to shoot them down with they fall in the chicken and it's like I can turn all that into stories. So for me, every moment of life is just amazing, you know? And um, if I wanna write a story, I just write a story. I don't care if I have permission to do it or if I even have a publisher to do it. I can go out on the street corner and read it to people. Nobody can stop you. And now with the internet, nobody can stop you. 
right? Yeah. You just take out the website, say, hey, decided to concept a new Star Wars movie, which hasn't been written yet. So I wrote it too. Here it is. I'll tell you on August 25th. And then, right, you, then you just have a show. Show your work. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I don't have any fear or uh, people call it lack of confidence. It's not really those things. But whoever was putting that in people on the conveyor belt kind of left that out of me. I, I, I just do it because not doing it is worse. Right. right. I, I become an Ian I don't like when I don't draw and write stories. And so I do it to stay sane. I do it to stay me. And I do it because it is the greatest, most wonderful chocolate box you could ever dip into. And it's ours, free, absolutely free. So as I say, Shadowline was a, a, a cheat and a trick. Um, if, you, if you want a sneaky backdoor into publishing your own book, become famous at something else. <laughs> and so I became famous at Star Wars, and I realized, wow, I could go to a publisher and get them to publish the Star Wars art of Ian McKay, and I could write the true stories of what happened up in that room upstairs above George Lucas's private office. And everybody was for it. I had a signed contract for the book, and then we heard from Lucasfilm that, you know, George is going to do his own concept art book first. So he asked if you would wait 10 years, and then you can do your book. <laughs> oh, and I'm saying you with my contract and the publisher's going and I went wait, wait I got an answer how about if we just take Star Wars off the title and make it the art of Ian McKay and they go great 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 you're not going to sue us and I went well <laughs> but you'll let me write a text for this right they go oh yeah 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 write anything you want <laughs> so what I did is I wrote a fiction story about my creative process Right? Because I, I never liked those movies where you watch the artist and to show the creative process, you zoom in on the furrowed brow and the, <laughs> the paintbrush. It's like, that's not creating. Creating is where you wander into a different world, become some sort of other creature that can battle deadlines and wrestle against the, the muses and all this stuff and somehow create life out of clay. And then you hear this voice go, lunchtime. And you're like, <laughs> you know, and it's hard to come back out of that world. I wanted to describe that experience of going to another world and creating. So that's what Shadowline is. That's the text of Shadowline. And I gave it to the publisher. I'm sure they didn't read it because they published it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And, and I did get a few comments afterwards like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so, so the inter there's an interviewer in the book. You didn't write this. No, I did write it, but I created the interviewer. Yes, he said that halfway through the book, but then he killed you. Could you explain this, please? <laughs> I go, too late, you published it. <laughs> so that's it. You just kind of do what you want and find your opening and go for it. And like I say, if they said no, I would have gone on the street corner and read it to everybody. So and there you go. Ian, you're magical because you've per perfectly segued us right into process here. I mean, you basically just gave us the thumbnail process of, of, of how uh, Tim uh, Shadowline came, came to be. Um, Mia, I'm going to just kind of swing it around through everybody else now. It's like, so with you, you know, we're, we're still working through the journey toward publication. But, you know, let's go back to the, the idea of, of how you find the time uh, to create this story amidst your other work and amidst, you know, paying the bills. We covered this a little bit last year, but give us give us your take there, and then I'll swing it to Greg, to Armand, and then to Victoria from there, okay? And then after that, we'll get into um, agents. So we're gonna motor through this bit, and then we'll get to agents. So Mia, start us off with this bit. Yeah, I mean, uh, because I, I've been working um, a day job uh, pretty much since, uh, for the last six years, it's been a slower process, but you know, I just find the time on my days off or before or after work, depending on when my shift is, you know, that's when I would do it. Um, obviously, the coronavirus has actually shut down my job. I mean, it did for a few months. Um, and then I actually uh, decided not to go back because I wanted to try to take this time to work on my book. So it's been really um, helping in that way. Um, I've been really lucky that I've been able to use this time. So um, time management right now is, is better than it was a, a, a few years ago. But yeah, back in 2013, I think my biggest problem was I quickly realized I didn't have the skills yet for the ambition I had for this project. And um, I, uh, like the rest of you, have been writing and illustrating my own stories, you know, since I was a kid or being, you know, coming up with my own stories and sort of got off the path and all that. And then um, 
I actually chose Alice in Wonderland, an Alice in Wonderland retelling, because I thought it would be easier to have a story with already a structure and characters that everyone knows and just to adapt it and get back into writing and ease my way into it. And it would be a quicker process. And it's actually been a lot harder <laughs> than I thought. Um, wow. And um, the, the thing is that back in 2013, it was a very different story than it even was in 2017 than it is now. And now it's becoming more and more of my own story. So uh, that's scary and exciting because people have a lot of expectations of a, of a classic like Alice in Wonderland. Um, and uh, another part of it too was uh, that I just wanted to, uh, like fantasy has always been a favorite thing of mine, but there's just a, not a lot of diversity in fantasy. And I wanted to, um, you know, do my part and change that a bit, like basically create the world that I would want to see more of. And so all of those things were a lot of pressure at the time, 2013, with my limited skill set. So I decided to actually take my time and build my skills over the years and not rush this process. Like this is a real passion project for me and pouring everything into it. And it's just like, it's been a fight because I think we want, we see social media, we see all these people putting out, you know, const it seems they're po constantly putting out content and it's all amazing all the time and there's like a rush almost to get your work out there but i just really pace myself and i was just like i need to focus on these skills and then i need and then i need to develop the look of the characters and that honestly didn't solidify until 2016. so it's like three years from the time i first got the idea and then in 2017 i actually decided to start going to conventions i had seen armand at like san diego comic-con with his images of timeless and everything like that and before it was even finished and i i love that idea that you're sharing the world before it's and the book before it's actually finished and growing an audience as you're creating the project um and at first i actually had an opposite idea about that that it's just only share it when it's done but when i started seeing how long this process would take uh i did i i do think that there's some value to bringing the audience along with you investing them in your journey and so in the past few years, I actually also started a Patreon page that's just for the process of my Alice project. And that's uh, really helped feel like I have a team that's behind me too, that wants to see this finished. And it's, it's always a good motivating factor whenever I, I'm stuck on a certain part of the project. And, um, and in terms of writing and illustrating and sort of those kind of go back and forth for me, I don't know if it's the same for the rest of you, but there'll be months where I'll be like 100% of the time just writing. And whenever I get stuck, I'll actually sketch at the beginning of my session. I almost need that to get me into the writing mode or like if I can't visualize a scene, I sketch it first and then I start writing. So that helps. And it's it's different from just being a novelist. Um, and then there'll be other months where I'm just painting, just making artwork. So it's it's like toggling back and forth. But um, and it's definitely a challenge. But I think the main thing, I, the main takeaway here is that I just want people to, to realize sometimes that if you do have an idea, a really great idea that you're passionate about and you don't have the skills, it's okay. You should go for it, but also understand it might take years and that's okay too. I'm a big believer in what you just said. And I think we are definitely on a similar path with trying to build an audience as we do the project. That's the same mentality I've had. Instead of sitting there panicking about saying, I've got to stockpile all this stuff and hold it back. The advantage to me learning this, this all these, these skills that you need to have to tell these stories is, to be using those images to to build my audience and it, it it's slow but it's it, i can see progress um and i i think for me like the images that i'm creating i feel like it's important to me to have those for me I, i'm working where i, I want the, the visuals to be the touchstone before i start committing story to those images um i don't think that's necessarily the way it is for all creators in fact i think i'm very much in a minority there mm -hmm. but i want to i want to prove that that can be done to myself um, um Greg, if you can, just real quickly, can you talk about, uh, you know, how, how you managed to do Timberline? Over, this was like an eight-year yeah. journey, wasn't it? To, to do By the time book. it was an actual book. Yeah, it was eight you were years. juggling a lot of other jobs while you're creating this. And yeah. also, it, Mia touched on the structure of kind of bouncing between the, the writing and the illustrating and whether the writing came before the pictures. Um, did you have a big outline before yeah. you did this? Give, give us a little bit well, of break. Mia nailed the process, I think, um, what she said. So what, what can I tell you? No, I think we all come to this naturally, uh, all of us here. And I think there's a lot of all of you out there that are um, working on building this within yourself and recognizing it is something that takes a bit. And I'm hoping panels like this will, will draw it out of people. Uh, I have a natural explorer in me and I don't get to explore much. I've been on a 
expedition with National Geographic and just loved it and wanted to do more of that, but I didn't have the funds to, or the time or all the other stuff uh, to be able to do that. But I wanted to do it with my mind and, and present that with people. So my character, I think, connected with me and I connected with the character and it, it was just the right kind of character to have to do that. Um, but I had to sneak up on it. I, th I think we sneak up on these projects. Uh, a friend of mine said, so you're going to start with page one, right? And I went, no, that would be dumb. Uh, it's, and, and then later on, the same guy said when I was painting, he said, so you're going to start with the first painting? I went, no, because then people would be able to see me get better as I went through 120 paintings. So I, I did a like, <laughs> filmmaking. I, I jumped in the center somewhere that I could figure it out. Like, okay, we've got everything ready for this, this take with all the actors and everything. We're going to shoot this and then we're going to expand out from there and then I'll cut it together. To, to make it go a little quicker here, um, I started with those thumbnails. I started visually because I thought, I. I can't get the words, they're not coming yet. And then I realized later after reading a bunch of stuff about writing that it's like drawing, you sketch it out. You know, with your writing, you sketch it with the writing and it's junk until you make it better. But uh, there I was in Starbucks with 14 other guys in their books, looking around, you know, <laughs> typing <laughs> and drawing little pictures. I felt so stupid, you, can't, you cannot believe how dumb I felt. And I thought, this is, this is the process. This is how you do this. This is how you draw it out of you. And then I read a bunch of stuff that talked about how to do that and realized that's the creative process. And, and I went from there. And just really quickly, uh, you know, my, my inner confidence went up and down. Some days I was riding high going, yeah, this is it. This is the thing. And the next day, boom, uh, it's like, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing? And uh, it was a different progress. I mean, a, a different book. It was going to be something that hasn't been on the shelf other than Dinotopia. I love that stuff and so many other illustrated books. Anyway, I, I could go on and on, but I'll leave it at that. The before, process I jump to Armand, before I jump to Armand, I bet you I can almost anticipate people are going to wonder, how did you pull yourself out of those moments when you didn't feel like I don't have it. Or was it just about getting up the next morning and doing it? Is it that simple? Or were there little tricks you would do to kind of like, whether it means going back to favorite inspirations or was there anything you would do to kind of snap yourself out of that? Well, two things. One is that I knew, I know how to draw. I know how to paint and I know how to do someone else's job. <laughs> so I said to myself, why don't I do that for me? And that would bring me back every time to those little thumbnails. Cause it doesn't matter what your budget is. You can do a thumbnail with millions of people in, in the scene and it's just little tiny heads and stuff. I, I could create massive, wild, crazy production uh, values in a little tiny stamp size thing and it wouldn't cost me a cent. Maybe a, you know, a mocha. Uh, but <laughs> while I was doing that. And then the other thing is the self-talk that we do. You have that observer that sits back here and, and you start typing and they go, what are you doing? Do you think you can do this? Are you an idiot? And it's the same guy I had when I was learning how to draw. So I would just say, get, get, get out of my head. Just let me get this on paper. Once it got on paper, that was it. I would start to go. And, and when it came to writing, I dove into a scene that I felt I knew that I had been there. And I just let the character talk to me and I wrote it down and uh, the observer was there and I'd say, shut up, just let me get this scene down and we'll go from there. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Armand, <laughs> in 600 pages that thing turned into, I mean, in the midst of, uh, you know, your animation career, your, well, no, you actually, you did call time out at a certain point, didn't you? Where you said, I'm just going to go after this whole, whole cloth, right? Yeah. Refresh us on what you, I know you kind of gave us a really nice presentation last year uh, about the evolution of, and the, the, how, how Timeless was created, but can you give us a little thumbnail there of, of, of um, again, about time management? I think that matters to a lot of people who are listening to this, how you found the time to create this thing amidst your career. And then, you know, again, just the way Mia and Greg have been talking about 
the balance of how you write and illustrate and which one, how, how those things dance. In the right, process. right. Well, you know, it's funny because um, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? And when you go back and you do the thing that you did before, you do it differently. <laughs> or it, I should say that the creative process is a living, growing thing that constantly evolves. Uh, and it changes as you change as a person. Just to talk just briefly about the first book, Timeless. When I wrote that book and my son had sort of thrown down the gauntlet and said, Dad, write me an adventure. I started thinking of the kind of adventures I wanted. And I decided I'm not going to put a limit on the kind of adventure I want to create. I'm going to create. And I had Jules Verne in my head. And I had H.G. Wells in my head. I had uh, Tolkien in my head. I had, but probably more so than all those guys who I had in my head was Frank Herbert who wrote this gigantic thing that when I was 12 years old, blew my head up. And I thought, I'm going to write an epic world that's different and build this world and have this character who's this Filipino American kid experience life in this changed world, you know, kind of thing. And so I started writing and holy cow, at the end of it, I had something the size of Dune, which of <laughs> course my publisher was just like, we can't publish this. You want to illustrate this? This is like an illustrated version of Dune. I had um, 180,000 words, right? And um, they said kids' books for middle grade is usually around 60,000 words. You got three books here. Um, as if I'm jumping forward. But, but the thing is, is what ended up happening was this. Because the only client when I started writing it was myself and my son, I said, you know, damn it, I'm just going to write and I'm going to draw. And so on the weekends, I would write and I would draw. On my car ride to Pixar, I had like an hour and a half commute every time. When I wasn't with the amazing Ian McKay going to work, I was by myself and I hit record on my phone and I'd just spout off ideas. Then on my lunch breaks, I'd spout off ideas and I kept a notebook. If you looked at my writing notebook, it's kind of hilarious because it's partially writing, mostly napkins and post-its, you know, and then I tape it in on top of my writing pages. So you flip and it's writing post-its, writing post-its, you know, doodles, all this sort of stuff. And um, finally what happened was I got into this rhythm where, okay, dad has to be left alone from these hours to these hours er every part of the weekend. And uh, as I kept writing and kept writing and kept showing it to the world, what ended up happening, I won't rehash into all the stuff that happened, but in the short of it, Timeless got noticed by 20th Century Fox and it got noticed by Harper Collins and uh, both expressed interest in doing it. And I realized that in, only, in order for me to create the draft that would be acceptable, because at the time Harper was looking at my 180,000 word story and he said, yeah, we like the story, we don't want it like that. That I would actually have to sit down and do it in a way that was right. And I would need to spend all my time doing it. So I finished up on a movie and I told Pixar, listen, I got a chance to write a book. I got a chance to do something I've always wanted to do my entire life, but I need to leave to do it. And they said, go do it. <laughs> and so I took all the money I'd saved and like listen to Greg and we, me and Greg had talked about how he had prepared to do it. Uh, I had been saving up my money because I knew at one point I just wanted to make the break. I needed to like be able to pay the bills for at least a year or so and do it. And so I lived off my savings, wrote it, and wrote, finally got it to a, a size that it was okay, showed it to the publisher, which, and then we also showed to the movie studio. And they kind of said, well, look, we want this completely done. And, and they were able to basically fund me to finish it. So they basically gave me an advance. Uh, they said, we like what you did. And I had to spend my own money, my own time, not working for anybody else but myself to get it into a shape where I could prove as proof of concept, this is what the finished product will be if I can do it. And they said, do it. And so I was able to raise enough money to just leave animation for a few years and just uh, do that. Um, but, uh, oh, did I answer your question? <laughs> I'm sorry. I think all of us are just minds blown over here. That's, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of what it's about, isn't it? It's taking a chance on yourself and jumping off that cliff. And it's so scary um, that you did it. And so, uh, Victoria, uh, so I'm, I'm still learning about you and about your project and you weren't with us last year. So I think really the audience is really gonna be hearing your story for the first time. Can you give us a little thumbnail about, you know, you started off there in the intro about the NaNoWriMo experience and how you wrote a novel. Um, it kind of got the, you know, kind of got the, the juices flowing for you. Was that City of Secrets? Is that, was that yep. birth experience? 
Okay. Yeah, so, um, the, my very first NaNoWriMo project was City of Secrets. Nice. Um, I wrote it based on a dream that I had. Like I had this like one little snippet of an interesting sequence and I was like, what is this? Like, who are these characters? What's happening here? And I actually pursued it as a novel and as prose because you know, it's a book about a moving city in a steampunk world. And I was like, that's going to be really hard to draw. <laughs> and, and if I can just hand wave that away with like, imagine it in your minds, <laughs> that would be ideal. Um, and so I wrote the story and it was 50,000 words, almost exactly. And when I shared it with my um, critique partners, a lot of them were like, you know, your story's good, your characters are good. Um, the relationships really work, but like, I can't see the world at all. Like you just didn't explain it enough. And I was like, but it, that's not what it's about. And then I realized that really my, uh, my weaknesses as a prose writer were in description because I can see it so clearly in my own head that I don't feel like I need to explain it to you. <laughs> and, you know, when I started to query it to publishers, I realized that like, oh, well, I should support my weakness with my strength and art. And then I just draw a picture and then I can be like, look, now you can see it too. <laughs> and I didn't have to actually like um, bridge that gap. And, you know, as a graphic novel, I think that it ended up being the perfect medium for it. But um, yeah, I did write it originally as a prose novel first. And, you know, I still love prose. I still write prose. But um, this project started that way. And NaNoWriMo, I think, was such a great experience. Even if you're not expecting to be a novelist, I still think that, like, having that deadline, doing it with everyone else, like, the, like you know, a bunch of people are all doing this project at the same time. Everyone's struggling every day. I think that those are lessons you can really take into any project that's big. Because with NaNoWriMo, you basically have to write 1,600 words a day, every single day. And if you don't, you will like screw yourself majorly. So to have that discipline and to teach you that, like just show up every day, even if you write 1,600 words of nonsense that you don't need, at least you came and at least you put in that work. And that was a huge lesson for me to be able to kind of continue to write this book and bring it to fruition, even as a graphic novel, because that's still how I work now. Like, after I sold the book, um, so I wrote this three years ago as a prose novel, and then I sold it a year and a half ago. And every day since, like, I basically had to show up for this book every day, even if I didn't feel like it. Like, I still had to bring my two or three pages of inks, 10 pages of thumbnails, whatever it was, and to be really strict about that schedule, otherwise it just wouldn't get done. And, you know, obviously, like, my experience is quite different than everyone else's because I do have deadlines. <laughs> like, I sold this book, and they're like, we need your inks by this date, we need your colors by this date. And um, coming from illustration and from concept art, deadlines, I'm very adherent to them. <laughs> so that was something that I had to kind of, well, I, I haven't had to, like, I just meet my deadlines every time. But uh, since then, I've heard my, my publishers be like, wow, you really hit your deadline every time. And I'm like, yes, of course. That's what <laughs> but apparently, that's not true of like all writers. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like I still love prose and I still write prose. And my process now, like when I'm doing inking, I don't have to put as much of my heart into every single page because, you know, the process of drawing and the process of writing are so separate and drawing like I can watch TV I can like have a podcast on like that's fine but when I'm writing I need like silence my brain is just working so hard so what I like to do now is actually while I'm inking because that just requires so little of my like emotional um, investment into those drawings because they're already set up you know it's just this is the part where I make it look nice right. um, I'm also drafting a novel at the same time because that kind of helps me keep that inspiration going at the same time that's fantastic Phenomenal. Um, I've got like three more questions for you actually, Victoria, but uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm looking at the clock right now and we did like exactly what I didn't want to do, which was we sat in process so long that I don't want us to have to go speed round on the actual publishing, but I think we are going to go speed round because I, I've got stuff I want to cover and I think the people out there want to hear. So we're going to go through this. We're going to start off with, uh, so Mia, I know, so you and I are kind of both on the, the journey toward publication. I, I do have an agent at this point for, for my project, you're working toward an agent, correct? Or are you even thinking you need an agent? What's your thinking at this point on that, I mean, getting I, an agent for yours? Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, actually up until last year, I was 100% in the self-publishing camp. And uh, when I talked, when I heard the panel that I was that was on with all of you last year, and I heard all your experiences, and I talked to you guys, and then talked or thought about all this since then, 
I've actually realized that my priorities are not aligned with self-publishing. And I would like to get into that a little bit just because um, I've done a lot of research on self-publishing since that was the route that I was originally going to go. And a lot of my artist friends have done the Kickstarters and all that stuff. Um, and I guess the way um, I think a lot of us all relate to wanting full control over our baby, right? Over the project we worked on for years. And that's the appeal, the, the main appeal of doing self-publishing. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's you're also publishing it yourself, distributing it yourself, marketing yourself when you're self-publishing and doing the art and the writing. And, and a lot of artists, especially the more entrepreneurial artists that I know and the ones with big followings have, might have an easier time at that. I don't have a particularly big following. And while I have learned a lot of business uh, stuff and self-marketing in the last three years that I've been going to conventions, it's not my favorite part of the process. And I think it's, you just kind of have to make choices based on your priorities. If you don't like doing those things, then you have to sort of be willing to compromise in other ways, such as working with a publisher. If you're going to hand that over to them, then giving some of the profit to them as well. But if you want 100% of the profit, then you also have to do 100% of the work. So, um, so yeah, it just it depends on your story, like or your project, what your priorities are, and there's going to be pros and cons to both. But with self-publishing, I guess it's like your distribution will, or your, your audience will be a bit smaller. It will be a more niche. It will probably be mostly uh, artists and um, people who are like art fans, like collectors. Um, it's just a smaller, uh, what is the word? Like a, a smaller audience that you'll be reaching if you're self-publishing, unless you literally have, um, you know, you're really good at business and getting yourself out there and that sort of stuff. And that's, it's just not what I got into this for, I guess. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I am open to to publishing, and I'd love to hear what you, your all experiences are about it because I hardly know anything about it. <laughs> yeah, I want to jump in before I pass this to Greg, and it, there was so much in what Mia just said that um, I, I'm totally like it, it echoes a lot of the way I feel about where I'm where I'm going with my project and why I'm doing it, and why I'm picking the path of an agent. And I just want to speak to the people out there who are listening to this. You don't have to have an agent to put your story out. I think. The, you know, the, the reason, and Mia's referring to our panel last year, where I think, I think we kind of uh, impressed upon her that all of us on the panel realized that she's, she's got an amazing project that we felt like would, um, it, it needed to be seen by the widest audience possible. And that even if, if, if she, all she wanted to do was just get it out there, well, that was fine. That was good. And we all supported that. But we thought, this is a really special thing you're doing. We think you're doing it in a very special way. And it would be a shame if this more pe the most people possible didn't see this. And I think perhaps that light bulb went on for for everybody out there. That doesn't mean you have to be successful. You have to do that. But I will say for the people out there that want to see their books in Barnes and Noble, that want to see their books in, on the widest platforms through the through the biggest conduits with the um, if the bigger the dream of seeing your book with the biggest audience, the more you need to consider having an agent. And I think it's it's almost mandatory if you're going to negotiate through the waters of publishing. You need one. To self-publish, you don't need one. And when we're talking about here is we're not talking about illustration reps. We're talking about literary agents that represent writers who are telling stories. Usually they're dealing with prose people. There are a number of agents such as mine who, who deal with prose, but also deal with um, illustrators. And then they have weirdos like me who are doing both. And um, just for the people out there, I'm with Joanna Volpe, who I think is one of the best agents on the planet. And she's with, uh, her, she's the president of New Leaf Literary. I think she's phenomenal. Um, so oh, real I'm, quick. Go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to, to interject real quick. Um, I do think that like a lot of people, especially the ones I've talked to, when they talk about publishing versus self-publishing, a lot of times they do talk about that control aspect. They really do want to have that, like their voice be very clear in it. And while I absolutely understand that that is super important, one thing that um, you may not maybe realize is when editors are if you have multiple editors who really want your book, and that usually does happen if you have a hot property, you'll get on the phone with many agents, like, or not agents, editors. So I, I got on like six editor calls for my last book. And a lot of the stuff that I talked to them about was just trying to get to understand, like, do they understand my vision? Are they going to help me shepherd my thing to be the best version of it that it could be? And actually having a team member on your side, your editor who gets you, who understands what you're trying to do and can help see like past the, the points that you maybe have blind spots to and could be like, this could make it stronger to make your vision stronger is actually a really useful thing too. Um, you know, we've all worked in film. We've all worked in a lot of these places where like we're helping these visions become realities. And I think that we all acknowledge that like if the director was the only person who made this, it wouldn't be as strong. In the same way that like when you're publishing your book, 
having that team who really understands you and really gets you can be a really, really positive aspect to your book. My book would not be as strong as it is today without my editors. And um, I, I'm really grateful for that. But a big part of it was me talking to those editors and making sure that they knew what I wanted. I wanted my story to be really dark. I wanted it to be very steampunk, which is not something that editors really love. But I found people who were like, yes, absolutely, 100%, we're here for that, we love that too. And that's something that you can actually screen for when you're going into publishing. When you get on the phone and you're like, hey, you guys wanna buy my book, cool. Here's what I wanna do with it, what do you think? And you can kind of tease out, like, are they the right team member for you? And this is something you have to do with your agent, too. Like, when you get on phone calls with agents, you have to just make sure they get your taste and they get you as a creator, not just like, oh, great, this person is going to help me. It's like, no, you have to pick the right person. And that's true of your editorial team as well. You, you just jumped ahead completely, but I absolutely love the way you did it because I did need us to ramp up and you did, did that perfectly. So I'm going to take that same combo and, and pitch it to everybody else. But before I do that, I want to stay on you, Victoria. So let's just jump back to the agent part. You, you segued it beautifully there where you were talking about that you did have to select that person. Can you give us a little thumbnail about the process of selecting an agent and how you, how you work through that process? Absolutely. So actually, I'm on my third agent right now, which is not unusual. A lot of people go through more than one. So your very first agent is going to be, you know, whatever the situation is, it can, can be good too. But if you end up having to like part ways with somebody, that's not a mark on you or on them. It could just be that you guys, your goals no longer align for whatever reason. So my very first agent was very much picture books, which is great because she was excellent at it. But while I was writing City of Secrets, I realized I didn't want to write picture books. I wanted to write these dark middle grade YA fantasies, and she just did not connect to that work at all. And so we parted ways amicably. This was not like a drama you know, situation, but we did realize that like the, the types of work we wanted to make were not the same. And so I ended up having to go through this process called querying. Querying is a very common thing that all prose authors have to do, and is also something I really encourage authors and illustrators, uh, graphic novelists, to do as well. Because I think a lot of times when we're graphic novelists, we'll have an agent approach us and we'll just be like, yes, okay, you, you've decided you want to be with me. And the actual truth is that you're the one with the talent and you're the one who has these stories. You need to make sure that the person that you're going to go with understands you, understands your work, understands where you want your career to go beyond just this one book. Um, and I was very lucky. My second agent was the one who got me my deal for City of Secrets. And the only reason we aren't together now is because she ended up leaving the industry, which wow. happens. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a tough world out there. And yeah, she just ended up being like, I, I'm out. And so I found my third agent who, um, you know, she was very supportive of me writing prose. She was very into both my fantasy work and like my next book is going to be a YA contemporary issues book and it's very different than this book and she loves that book too so I know that like she loves every aspect of me and that's kind of what you look for when you search for an agent you don't just want to find anyone or even the person who approaches you first please talk to at least two other people <laughs> please talk to three people <laughs> at the very bare minimum so then you know at least like okay I'm making the right choice and you know, at, in the end also, I don't want to scare anybody. I don't want you to think that if you make the wrong choice, like your life is going to fall apart. You can just <laughs> leave them. You can just find a new one. It's really not that big a deal. But querying is a very strict process that has its own rules. Um, I have a blog post on my website, victoriaying.com, where I actually detail all the different steps in querying because there is a very official way to do it. And if you don't do that process, your email will get junked because they just have so many emails. So anyhow, um, you can look up querying on Google, like you just Google how to query. And the only difference is with an illustration or you know, illustrated novel, graphic novel, you wanna include samples of art as well. That's right, beautiful. That was <laughs> uh, no, that was phenomenal. And I think what you said, I hope the people out there are hearing this, that it, whether it be the agent or the editorial support or editor, the editor that you're working with, you want people who are going to champion your work, especially when it's an agent. You, you want that person, like as, as Victoria kept saying, you want someone who understands the work. You want someone who is excited about it and it's not just another project. And looking for that chemistry is just super important. I, 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 she, she nailed that one. Greg, can I pass it to you now as far as your uh, you know, finding the agent experience? Can you give us a thumbnail? Yeah, yeah briefly on that. I, uh, 
I, over the years, I have finally learned how to pitch my work. How to <laughs> I can I can sell somebody on buying my artwork, and it's taken a long time to figure out how to talk to people about my work. And in the beginning days, and I know all the young folks in the audience um, have heard that oh, you got to sell your work, and it's not comfortable, and all that. But it is comfortable because you're 100% behind yourself. And I had to learn that. Uh, so I finally got to the point where I could pitch my artwork. Well, I use the same technique to pitch, pitch the book. And you want to have uh, that elevator pitch right there, ready to go anytime you find yourself on the street, in a car, in an elevator, to pitch somebody about your idea. So. With all that in mind, I was able to sell my idea to a guy that was an agent. And then he became, he got out of agenting and went and, and started this uh, small part of uh, a publishing house within Simon & Schuster. So I had to re-pitch him on, on the book. Eventually he bought it and then I had to go find an agent. So the crazy thing about that, which worked out really good, is that once you've kind of sold the book, when you call an agent uh, or you text an agent, or I mean, you, you uh, email an agent, you're going to get an answer in 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. Easy. Because <laughs> yeah, like, you're like, hey, <laughs> what's the work for them, right? <laughs> What was great was that uh, there were five people that, that my editor said, contact these guys, I like them. And uh, I talked to all of them eventually. And in talking with them, they were all excited. And then some of them dropped out. And one of them was a supreme agent that I backed away from because he didn't understand what I was talking about for my project. So very much like Victoria, I started talking to a guy that he and I, just linked. He knew exactly what I was trying to do. He knew exactly what I wanted to do. And he was the guy I went with. Uh, and that happened with illustration, an illustration agent. Uh, I was, was in the early days. I knew a lot of agents and showed my book. And it was only the guy that we connected that I went with. The, the guy that knew I wanted to do oil painting, painterly stuff in a market that nobody cared about that. It was all detail and, and uh, imagery at the time. And I went with him because he wanted to push that. We worked together for decades. Uh, it was great. Anyway, uh, I'll let somebody else talk. That's kind of unique. But really what I'm saying is when you have a project like this, you want to do your homework on your project and be ready to pitch it all the time, constantly. I never got tired of, of my story because I was always trying to Put it out there. Put it you out still, there. Do you still remember what the, the elevator pitch basically was when you were first? I mean, now you, I know you've got the elevator pitch. Now the book's been out forever. But I mean, yeah. what was it kind of like when you first were trying to pitch it? What was that basic elevator pitch as an example for the audience out there? Can you remember? Well, the very, the very first pitch didn't work. Uh, and that pitch was, I'd like to do a book like Dinotopia. And everybody, all these publisher guys would say to me, What's Dinotopia? <laughs> <laughs> what? And uh, I had to explain Dinotopia. So I ruled that one out. And uh, uh, basically, I started pitching the character. I'll tell you what. This is very important for everybody. That image, whatever image you pick, that image is going to boost your interest immediately. I held up timberline above the timberline and i said i want to do a story about this guy and how he meets those bears boom they're in within seconds they're like what they were in and and i use that every time every uh, image for timberline i wanted a little bit of a catch that like these airmen that i have i put deep sea diving helmets on them and they're like what what is that and if you can get that little interest going like that in your story um that does all the talking for you. After that's, that, it gets... That's, that's the thing that we have that the pros only writers don't have, which is we have the ability to create visual hooks. So yeah. you use your visual hooks to hook 
yeah. the, the, the Absolutely. There you go. I, I, I have a little bit of a theory real quick. Yeah. The very visual writers do phenomenal work. So somebody like Frank Herbert doing Dune, that thing was visual. You got that thing immediately. Uh, some of the other books I read, um, I'm trying to come up with a picture in my head, what's going on. But the ones that are visual, man, they just, boom, they're right in there. Yeah, right on. Armand, agents, uh, do, you, do you need me to give you a prompt or you want to just run with this one? Like, how did you find your... Uh, <laughs> Your agent for this. Yeah, actually, I'm going to kind of riff off, off of both what Victoria said and what Greg has said, and, and a little bit of what Ian has said previously about something. And, and the thing is, is that I'm going to start off with what Greg said was really, really important in terms of your pitch, right? And getting an agent, it, it's almost kind of like when you're an artist and you're pitching your portfolio to get a job. And when you do that, you're honing in what you're representing yourself with the very, very best of what you have to offer and nothing more. You get straight to the point, this is what I can do for you. And if they look at it and go, this is what this person can do for me, they're in, right? And so the thing is, is that when you have an idea that you're crafting and you're trying to get somebody to represent you, then you owe it to yourself to sort of put the time into refining down how you present what it is your story is in a way that is appealing to them. That is in a way that after you finish your last sentence, they go, I've got to hear the next sentence. I've got to see the next image. What I did in getting my age and what I did in getting timeless was a combination of curating the perfect elevator pitch by trying it out on bunches of different people and having a single image that knocked people on their sock, knocked them out of their socks. I had uh, the big red robot and the little boy, and that was it. And I um, worked on my elevator pitch by taking it to conventions and showing the one image and trying to sell people on buying my print but essentially it was giving an encapsulated, well, this is about a story I'm writing and here it is. Image, boom, three sentences and that was it. And so I would modify what that pitch was based on people's reaction, based on people's feedbacks. And when you read like um, famous screenwriting books and stuff about dealing with Hollywood, you hear a lot of the same sort of techniques where people are taking their story ideas and bouncing it off of different types and refining it, refining it, refining it. So you're coming up with the greatest possible uh, appealing set of information packaged in the right way. Now to that, when I go to Victoria, I, before, when I sort of was playing around with the idea of not doing self-published because it started out as a self-published thing, I went to agents and I wrote the query. And the thing is about the query is this, is that a query is simply not a letter that is, here's my biography and this is my story. You should, you know, will you take me on? You know, the thing is, is you're presenting yourself as something that they are going to want. And you have to write about, you have to write to them in a way that number one, doesn't waste their time by following the template. Number two is written in a way that engages them to go, man, I got to see what this manuscript's about, you know, and it is, it is a big help when you have that visual, but it's not simply um, just basically saying, oh, here's, here's my resume and I got a story. And, and this goes to the Ian thing now here in this, I would be an absolute liar if I said the fact that I worked for Pixar and Disney and all these things didn't make people pause. Like if Greg said, I'm an award-willing illustrator in the Society of Illustrators that gives people pause. That you made La Tierra would give people pause. The things we do, the things in conventions you've gone to, Mia, would give people pause. And so you know what it is? It's not selling yourself, it's being it's, it's basically showing the publisher the investment you've already made in yourself, in your career, and that's what they have a chance at getting. They get all that if they give you, the, you know, the moment. You're, you're serious enough to work in the film industry or work uh, making art and putting in galleries. You're a serious person. You're not, you're not going to waste their time. Make sure what you show them is that. And the last thing I want to say about agents is everyone who's talked about them is right. There's right and wrong. I had three agents that wanted me to make my characters 17 years old. Mo uh, I'd say two of the three wanted the characters to be a girl, not a guy, and have a good, a good guy and a, a bad boy. And it's a love triangle set in this dystopian world. And we got to change it into a government. I'm like, oh my God. You know, I'm like, I like Hunger Games, like Divergent. Like, they're like, yeah, but different. Because, you know. <laughs> Because it's, you know, it doesn't have to be a white girl. It can be a Filipino. You can keep a Filipino. It's a Filipino teenage girl who's in love with a good guy and a bad boy. I'm like, oh my God. And getting the right agent that gets it 
is a lot. And one last thing I'll say, and I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot, is that when people ask me this question, I go, what are the books you like? You know, how do I, or they go, how do I find an agent? I go, well, what books do you like to read? And they tell me a list of books. And I go, great, go pick up those books, look at the, who, who represents that author, and then go and ping that agent and their agency and see the kind of work they represent. More than likely, you are going to have a better chance of finding an agent that's already in your realm of taste and storytelling and genres than if you just simply shotgun. I'm just going to pick, you know, 100 agents who make a lot of money and, and hit them up. Hit the people that you have the greatest chance of them responding because they, res they, re they represent the kind of things that you already like. And everybody says about. so much on social media these days and you know agents are no different and so you can literally kind of watch certain people and wh what they say not only about their professional life but their um their, their reading life their personal life and you can see what their tendencies and habits are and the things that they really enjoy what sets them off and yeah you know, do, do your on that note your sorry. Uh, just real Go quick ahead. on that note um there's a hashtag called uh mailing or manuscript wish list so mswl if you google if you if you search that in twitter hashtag mswl you'll see the manuscript wish lists of all of the the agents who are posting them like they're like i really want a pirate fantasy or i really want a mermaid story or you know whatever and that way you can see exactly who's looking for exactly what you're making <laughs> wow beautiful wow so the clock went off in my head as far as, you know, we're at an hour or so, and that's usually where you want to just kill these things. And actually, this is usually where you get kicked out of the room in a, in a normal way. <laughs> um, but since this is online, and I really don't like going past an hour, um, I do think that there's a little bit of material left that we need to squeeze out of this before we sign off and call recess. So, um, you know, we, I think we've kind of covered the agent. Ian, I'm going to kick it to you here next. Um, I think a lot of people in the audience would love to hear Okay, I, I think with you it's unfair with Shadowline because they 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 had you first of all, then they've got the Star Wars angle, so it it sold itself. I don't even know if you had an agent. Who cares if you had an agent? Yeah, there you go. No. <laughs> so let's jump to the thing that I think a lot of people out there would love to hear. Let's just say you've got another project coming up that you can't talk about, which I suspect is the reality here, where you've got a book that you're working on, can't really talk about it, and even though you can't tell us what the pitch would be for it, how how do how does an Ian McKay pitch this thing? especially maybe if it's not for something that's one of the most recognizable franchises on the planet, let's just say, you know, how would you, how would an Ian McKay pitch that? So I wrote a list that I can't show you. <laughs> all the book projects and the other thing that's not a book project, but started as one I have in the works. Um, none of them are with the publisher of Shadowline. So every single one I went to, except, one of them's with the same, two of them are with the same publishers, but every other one is with a different publisher or a different studio. And <clears throat> that was deliberate. I don't have an agent. Um, I don't want an agent. And it's not because I don't like agents and I don't think they're useful. I think the right agent is worth gold. But um, I have an attorney. And I make the deals. I call cold call people. I show them what I need. Star Wars has helped a lot, but it only gets you so far. Once you're in that door, you have to, the elevator pitch is the amount of time, attention that a, a studio exec or a publisher actually has. And it keeps getting shorter every year. Um, and you really have to nail it very quickly. And Armand uh, and, and everyone else that said, it's really about getting them excited about what you have to give them right? What is it they can have that's the best candy in the box that they don't already have? And then they jump all over you, which is great, right? So my attorney, once I've made that connection, closes the deal. And I can stay out of that process. Not completely. You still are driving the ship and you still need to steer things, even with your attorney, you know, make sure that they understand this is what you need from this project. But I love, now we're doing the business and you can just leave the rest aside. Um, what everybody said about agents, or sorry, about editors, I think as Victoria said it best, um, that's my team player. I wouldn't do this without my editor. And I deliberately picked my editor. It didn't come from the publisher, and then I forced it on my publisher. Fortunately, he knew the publisher as well. But um, the editor, he's the he was the president of the Lewis Carroll Society of America. He's, he's got the world's biggest Alice in Wonderland collection. So why wouldn't he understand a story about going to an artist's ethereal other world and battling muses and deadlines? Of course he got it. So what he did 
He didn't come in and try to change the story at all. All he would do is say, okay, this sentence here where you said blah, blah, blah. What did that mean? So I explained, he goes, well, it doesn't say that. <laughs> Those words don't communicate that. I went, oh, oh, I forgot to tell you this part of it. He goes, well, put that in the sentence. Because <laughs> it's true. I, all us artists are so visual, right? Why would I need to describe that? Because a lot of people aren't. And, and what's really important, especially for artists, is there are more senses than eyes and sight. So I had to be reminded that what does it smell like? What does it sound like? You know, what else is going on in this room other than what you can see? So my editor has been invaluable. And on every other project, I always go back to that editor. I at least discuss it with, his name is Mark Burstein. I always discuss it with Mark. He isn't always the editor on the projects that I have, but he's always the person I'll go back to because I trust him and he's a partner in this. And using the analogy of children, right? These are all of our children. Yes! Do you have children? <laughs> I know you do, our mom, but if you have children, you know you don't want to be everything for them. <laughs> You'll never get anything done if you are. You want a partner and you want schools and you want friends and that way they become enriched by all the other people they interact with. The same is true with stories. You're still the, the one responsible for calling time out or whatever it is at the end of the day, but I love all this other feedback that comes in to my children and makes them better. And when they start misbehaving, I can bring them back and, you know, make that an experience for them too, because it's my story. It always is your story, right? So, beautiful. Um, when the pandemic hit, it shut down the reprint of Shadowline and it shut down the sequel to Shadowline. That publisher, for whatever reason, um, backed away from that project. Maybe it was more expensive for them or they just shut down period. I, I still don't know. Um, and that was fine. That was fine because I have a French door closet in the next room, literally behind this one. And it is wall to wall filled with stories that I have written that I've not published. So, and actually I had a heart attack three years ago and, and died and then came back at one of those experiences. And, um, and that was awesome, but we'll talk about that another time. I wouldn't have missed it, it was great. That's another panel, Ian. <laughs> right? But, yeah. but when I came home, the epiphany was opening the closet door and realizing, oh, oh, all you would have vanished with me. Oh, what an idiot. I better write you up and get you out there. So for the last three years, that's been my goal, get them out. I don't care how I get them out. Um, I just have to write as fast as I possibly can. And there's one particular set, and I scooped other stories into it. But I've been writing these for 20, 30 years now. And they're just random stories, right? They just, they all happen to take place in the same town uh, throughout history. And some are dinosaur stories, some are end of the world stories, they're cyberpunk, post-apocalyptic, and they all take place in this, this one town. So I was, I was writing that, I found a publisher for it, so now I'm doing my anthology only prose, right? There's no, there's no pictures for any of this. Oh, wow. And then um, a friend, filmmaker friend came around and said, oh, see this one that's got vampire in the title? I'm doing a horror anthology. Would you write a screenplay and let us like, make, a, make a show out of this? And I went, well, it's not really a vampire. He goes, oh, I don't care. It's got vampire in the title. Like, <laughs> okay. So I sat down and I rewrote that story as a script. And I've written, I've written 15 to 20 scripts. Like I say, I've sold them all. I've had several produced, um, all optioned. And it's just like doing your art, right? Of course you can draw pictures. Of course you go out there and sell them. You even can have a career that can span 20, 30 years. And then all of a sudden, one day you do a painting where you realize, oh, that one's actually good. <laughs> I fooled them on all the other ones. <laughs> but this one, I knew what I was doing. And I knew the effect, it, and it worked. And better yet, I could do it again. Because I remember with watercolor, Jesus, watercolor was the hardest medium in the world. And then someone showed me, and, and several watercolor paintings later, just one day, I did this painting, was like, oh, oh that's how you do it. <laughs> and I've never worried about it since, right? So with writing, I've been writing all my life. I've been professionally publishing writing only since about 1990. 
and most of it's screenplays, right? Not prose. And after 15 to 20 scripts, I wrote one script where I went, oh! And the fun thing was when you send those ones out, they're just like walking into the agent with the thing that they, they go, oh goody, oh goody, right? Suddenly we were offered $5 million for this little script I wrote that's only 14 pages long instantly. Oh. And, and everyone I showed it to was like, oh, wow. <laughs> and that's nice. It's nice to have that. But I didn't give it, honestly, sorry, sorry for the word, but I really didn't care because this was just a script. I had already written the story. And to me, that story was the real thing. And I have, I have 24 at least, maybe 48 other stories from that same series all either written or in the process of being written. So I finished it in the form I wanted to finish it. Rewriting it as a screenplay maybe was easier because I'd written those and I knew what it was. And I knew when you change it into a film, well, I can't do that because that was a literary trick. I have to find a visual way to do that. So you're working with the right problems, right? You're not in, in the deep end struggling. So it was the easiest thing I've ever done. It yeah. really was. As far as the pros, um incarnations of these stories are we talking about you working on a short story collection or is there one yeah. idea no it's, well there are short stories and novellas and it's an anthology it's it's my desperate deep love of ray bradbury and mm -hmm. not trying to do ray bradbury because in the end you can only do it yourself are you right. ready to who's publishing these yet or is it we're not there yet we're can't tell you that <laughs> <laughs> i okay. can't tell you who's publishing it and i can't tell you which studio has picked it up as a streaming series yeah but um i have both now I have the streaming series, for which I'm showrunner, producer, director, designer, head writer, and I have my anthology. And I have not gone through an agent. I did all of that through my attorney, who was good enough to make sure that I still own all the publishing rights, all the movie rights, everything. The, the studio only owns the TV series rights. And I co-own that with them. I think it's really important to tell the people out there as we, I mean, we, I, we've broken my rule about the one hour panel, but this has actually been, <laughs> So I'm, I'm actually cool with this running as long as it has. We're going to bring it home here pretty soon. But what Ian just said about, look, I don't have an agent, but I got an attorney. So I want to just impart to people out there, the, the, the wider the distribution you want to see for your story, uh, the more important it is to, to have that advocate who can handle the legal side of things. And so that Absolutely. is what these agents do. Uh, that's, or that's one of their specialties. And that's uh, a huge part of their business. And uh, no matter how experienced or how savvy you are as a business person, believe me, you want that person with you. So even though Ian is saying, hey, I, I don't have an agent, he's got that attorney. And so it, it, he's, he's doing it differently as Ian does a lot of things <laughs> from, from everybody else, which is, which is why he's Ian and why he's so beautiful. But <laughs> remember what he's saying here, what we're all saying is you, you do want to have that person who can strategize that part of the deal, you know, so, so that you're not left there all by yourself and get eaten by wolves, quite frankly. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's important to remember that to, to go with that attorney, I have that editor, and I also have some lovely, wonderful author friends, people that I love, people I really admire, who are part of my inner writing circle and who read my work and give me good, honest feedback and all the rest. But remember, it's never, it's never about, boy, this would be a better story if you did this. It's always, what were you trying to say here, yeah. right? I didn't get this part. Nobody tries to change what you're saying if you're with the right people. That, for me, that's the litmus mark, right? Yeah. They're supporting you. They're not trying to write their story through you. Right on. All right. Yeah. I, um, I, just I, real quick, I think that that's kind of the big leap from coming as a like commercial artist to being the creator of your own work is really learning how to take that criticism and understand what someone's trying to say. Yes. Like if you were just an illustrator and you show your AD something, your AD is like, change that. You're like, okay, you change it, right? Because that's, that's the idea. You're working for them. But once the project is yours and you have like a critique partner who's like, hey, I didn't like this, you have to decide for yourself, like, do I believe them? And is that like, do I believe that? Do I also think it's weak? And having that confidence and learning how to decide, okay, that piece of criticism is useful, that piece of criticism is not. Like that's a real distinction that takes time, but it's something that you only learn once you can have those people that you trust who will give you that kind of feedback. Right. Yeah, you it's are funny, the- It's funny, you, go ahead, Greg. You are the arbiter of taste in your own project and your own world. And you have to take 
that information from all different angles and, and filter out what works for you. Yeah. Go ahead. I find that all criticism is useful because everyone is an audience member. Yeah. All solutions are practically useless because right. they don't know how to fix it, only you do. So I think you're saying the same thing, right? If, right. if somebody's negatively react or but was bumped by something because they didn't get it, fix it. But they don't take their suggestion because it's almost right. always wrong. Right. <laughs> I think the way we just wrapped it up right here um, and brought this to a close with understanding that you know when you're going to tell your own stories, they're your stories, and therefore, as Greg said, you know you're the arbiter of taste within within your world, and uh, understand that. Any other last bits of uh, nuggets, and I do mean nugget of advice you want to throw out. I thought that was about as good a way as you could close it as anything else. Anyone got anything? Victoria, Armand, Greg? Just one, one thing I was just going to say, it's, it's a lot about, I think now as I see this uh, growing, uh, like with our, our projects here, and I talk to students who want to do what a lot of us have done, uh, it's about connecting with the community of all of us trying to do this. So if people connect with us here on the panel and start the conversation going about all this, this is, this is what we do. We're illustrators, we communicate and yeah. we trade ideas. And I think, I think it's important for someone who wants to do this to know that there are people who will listen to what their project is and there are people that will help. Yep, I have a nugget. <laughs> <laughs> When I was an illustrator only, actually I've never been an illustrator only, when I was doing more <laughs> illustration in my career, um, I had all my heroes on the desk. I had Rockwell there, Frazetta, I had all the people I loved, and the paintings were always around me when I was working, so I could remember what to aspire to, and decide <laughs> how did he paint a shoe? And I would always look at their stuff, and I remember trying to paint some grass, thinking, <gasps> how did Rockwell do grass? And so I picked up his book and looked, and then over the top of the book, there's a window, and outside the window is my lawn. And there's all this grass. <laughs> so I went outside and I sketched grass and painted some grass and I came back in and I put those books away. And for the last 30 years, I've never had another artist book open on my table again, ever. Uh, writing is the same. At first, you know, Ray Bradbury is there and, and everyone else is there that I really admire, but it's mostly just Ray Bradbury. Uh, I, I guess John Collier and, and people like that, people that people have forgotten about but they write so beautifully. The use of words is beautiful. Um, they're not on my table anymore. Because in the end, you can only be you. And you is special, you is different. You is a snowflake that will never be again. So if you can communicate that. So writing and drawing and telling stories is about being honest and honestly saying how you see it, how you feel about it. And for me, that's the big step. You're not trying to make something commercial. You're not trying to sell it. Your foremost thing is to be truthful and communicate an experience. There you have it, kids. Simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're going to wrap it up here. Victoria, Armand, Ian, Greg, Mia, thank you. Um, I'm John Picasso. This has been fantastic. Bobby, Jim, thanks for bringing us together here um, with the audience with the Lightbox Expo uh, weekend. And uh, anybody, if you got questions, you can reach out to with, reach out to all of us on uh, our social media conduits. I think most of us are on social media, Twitter, Instagram, uh, maybe a little bit of Facebook at this point, um, if they don't end the world first. Um, <laughs> we're going to call it recess here. And um, I just want to, again, thank Jim and Bobby for, for bringing us together. So uh, yeah. signing off and uh, take care of each other out there. Thank you. Thank you all, folks. Good luck. Thanks.